Beijing has promised to go carbon neutral by 2060, but many are questioning whether the reality of its energy production will allow it to live up to that vow. A Chinese giant narrowly escapes again. Debt-trapped real estate developer Evergrande managed to dodge default with a last-minute bond payment. But the move hasn't eased concern. A third term and five more years in power. That's what could await China's communist leader Xi Jinping. He's just taken one step closer to that goal with the approval of a new resolution. How expensive is decoupling with China really? Australia's economic growth says no, while Europe is trying to learn from its example. And American basketball star Anes Cantor is under pressure. The NBA has asked him to remove his shoes, which called to free Tibet. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Global leaders are wrapping up the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow. On Wednesday, the U.S. and China reached an agreement to boost cooperation on climate efforts and cut emissions. But questions remain. Will China keep its promises? The 26th UN Climate Summit, known as COP26, is drawing to a close. Wednesday at the conference, U.S. climate envoy John Kerry issued a joint declaration with Chinese climate negotiator Xie Zhenghua. Now, the two largest economies in the world have agreed to work together to raise climate ambition in this decisive decade. Both sides have agreed on key areas of cooperation in closing the emissions gap, like reducing methane emissions, protecting forests, and phasing out coal. Kerry called the agreement a roadmap for present and future collaboration. The United States and China have no shortage of differences, but on climate, on climate, cooperation is the only way to get this job done. Despite his optimism, many are questioning whether the Chinese Communist Party will fulfill its climate commitments at the cost of cutting back on economic growth. A recent report in the New York Times noted that China's new coal production has exceeded the mining capacity of all of Western Europe in a single year, a tremendous burden on global climate efforts. And although Beijing promised to address methane emissions, Xi did not commit to the Global Methane Pledge, a plan signed by over 100 countries to cut methane emissions 30 percent by 2030. What's more, Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping was neither present at the summit nor did he offer any further pledges, according to a senior analyst at the Heritage Foundation think tank. Even as China expands its buildup of renewables like wind and solar, these efforts could be driven by domestic energy shortages instead of a sincerity to combat climate change. And now we look at why many are questioning China's zero emissions promise. A financial service firm says this would require China to almost rebuild the way the economy is structured. Right now, almost two-thirds of the country's energy comes from coal. A report says for China to reach zero emissions by 2060, it would need to close about 600 coal-fired power plants. But the country is building them at a rate that outshines the rest of the world. With these plants, China added more than three times the coal power than the rest of the world added in the same amount of time. And it is planning to generate over 200 gigawatts more, with the new plants under construction. Currently, China is the world's biggest coal consumer, using more than half of the world's coal. And even for China, it took decades to reach this point. If we look at this data here, over the past several decades, despite other countries also increasing their coal consumption, none of their curves were as dramatic as China's. The nation more than doubled its coal consumption over the past 40 years. The trajectory it's on could be hard to stop. Earlier this year, China was tested on its coal resilience. Authorities there ordered coal mines to reduce production to cut emissions. But then a surge in energy demands met with low domestic coal supplies, and it led to a spike in coal prices. And as power companies can't raise energy prices until they get the authorities' approval, they produced less power so as to not lose money. This resulted in power outages in some regions, and China's northeast was hit particularly hard. In light of the power outages, the Chinese regime reopened some coal mines and ordered them to ramp up coal production. Cash-strapped Chinese developer Evergrande once again survived narrowly with a last-minute bond payment, but that did little to reduce concerns in the sector. Evergrande has dodged default again. 
A Reuters source said Thursday that some bondholders received overdue payments at the last minute. That's the third time in the last month that the ailing Chinese developer has narrowly avoided a default. The world's most indebted property firm has over $300 billion in liabilities. If it goes under, investors fear a ripple of other collapses across China's $5 trillion property sector. The U.S. Federal Reserve has warned of risks to the global financial system. Thursday's news hasn't done much to allay fears. The focus now is on other cash-strapped developers with payments due. Rival Kesa Group has the most overseas debt of any Chinese property firm bar Evergrande. It's already pleaded for help from creditors. Now the question is whether Beijing will step in to tackle the sector's woes. Regulators and government think tanks have held meetings with developers in recent weeks. That leads some to think that policies will be adjusted to help the sector avoid disaster. Those hopes and the Evergrande payment helped stocks rally on Thursday. An index of China's biggest real estate shares jumped almost 8%. One of the world's most important chip makers says it will open a new plant in Japan. The move comes amid a historic shortage of chips. Semiconductors, or chips, power our modern life. Without them, our phones, computers and fighter jets wouldn't work. And even though the company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, isn't a household name in America, the U.S. relies on this one business to make some of its most advanced chips, like those used in defense applications. The most advanced chips could be as small as 5 nanometers. That's smaller than a virus. And right now, only TSMC and Samsung have the ability to make them. America's most advanced chip maker, Intel, is stuck at 10 nanometers. TSMC is based in Taiwan. The company also makes chips used in cars, where there's a surging demand and supply crunch around the world. TSMC said earlier this year that it would spend $100 billion to expand production. The new plant in Japan will focus on low-end chips for the auto and tech industries, but it won't be able to ease the supply crunch for now. Construction will start next year, and the factory won't start producing chips until 2024. Tokyo welcomes the move and plans to give the company subsidies. TSMC is also expanding its footprint in other countries. It's currently building a $12 billion chip plant in Arizona, and it's also increasing production in China. Major clothing and shoe companies are relocating their factories. They are moving production from Asia to countries closer to the U.S. and European stores. They learned a lesson from earlier this year, when China and Vietnam shut down production due to a resurgence of CCP virus cases. Factories in Bosnia-Herzegovina could be among unlikely winners from the global health crisis. They're gaining new orders from major clothing brands which have fallen out of love with Asian producers. The big labels are smarting from disruption to production and shipping sparked by the health crisis. Bulgaria, Romania, Morocco, Brazil and Turkey are among other countries seeing new interest. In Bosnia, factory owner Radenko Bubic says business is booming. Tens of companies have contacted us already, ones that entirely or partly operate in the East. There were several tours of our production capacities. Some of them announced their arrival in the second half of November and the first half of December. Plastic clogs maker Crocs is one to say it's moving some production to Bosnia. U.S. shoe retailer Steve Madden said last week it had cut production in Vietnam and shifted much output to Brazil and Mexico from China. In Turkey, apparel exports are set to hit a record high $20 billion this year. Dejan Ristic is a Serbian factory owner. Demand has increased. It's obvious that big European firms that manufactured in China wish to transfer to this part of Europe. It's a chance for us to increase production, to increase capacity. That said, some things are a bit limiting for us. The lack of labour, the fact that Europe doesn't get that labour prices here are not the same as in China. But I think they will understand because the problems are getting bigger. In China, transportation problems are on the rise, as well as problems with the delivery of merchandise. So I expect and hope that this is an exceptional opportunity. China remains a huge player in clothes making, but Vietnam is feeling the chill. Last month, its government said clothing exports could be $5 billion short of target this year due to the health crisis and labour shortages. 
Shipping price is also one of the problems. According to the Hoey Robinson Container Ship Charter Index, the price of chartering a giant container ship is 10 times more than it was a year ago. Products in China are getting more expensive. This could affect the whole world, especially the U.S., which is importing more from China than ever before. Chinese factory prices are rising at a record rate. Official numbers show producer prices up 13.5 percent on the year. That's the highest in 26 years. This as China is going through a power crunch. With coal prices soaring, pushing up energy costs for producers. Industries at the early stage of productions are feeling the most pain. For coal businesses, prices are more than double what they were a year ago. And prices in the oil and gas extraction industry rose 60 percent. Factory prices are the amounts that retailers pay to the manufacturer. And while retailers' prices may not be rising at the same rate as factory prices, they would still be affected. Chinese Communist leader Xi Jinping seems to be a step closer to fulfilling his ambitions, having a third term starting next year. It's not easy for him because he is already 68. And within the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, top leaders at this age are usually expected to step down when their current term ends. But now the party has approved a resolution seen as further consolidating Xi Jinping's power. That's according to the CCP's official Xinhua News Agency on Thursday. Their report says the party's history taught the Central Committee to stay steadfast in 10 areas and that the highest priority is the CCP leadership. The resolution was settled at the sixth meeting of the party's top officials with a group of about 370 members that chooses its new leaders every five years. This year's meeting has run since Monday behind closed doors in Beijing. Before the meeting, the draft resolution attracted attention. But no specifics were published on Thursday. Yet experts commonly believe the resolution will promote the personality cult and dictatorship of Xi Jinping. This so-called historical resolution is rare in the country's history. It's only the third of its kind since the CCP's founding 100 years ago. The first one was under Mao Zedong, Communist China's first leader, and another under Deng Xiaoping, who launched reforms that turned China into an economic powerhouse. Australia has set an example in fighting against communist China, and the European Union has a plan to learn from it. China used to be Australia's major trade partner. But when Australia began criticizing the communist regime about its human rights abuses and advocating for an investigation into the origin of the CCP virus, Beijing began imposing sanctions on Australian commodities, one after another for more than a year. However, data shows that in that time, the Australian economy grew. It suggests Beijing's impacts on Australia have so far been surprisingly minimal. According to U.S.-based Radio Free Asia, Australia's GDP growth rate in the fourth quarter last year reached over 3 percent, and its GDP growth rates exceeded 3 percent for two consecutive quarters. That's a new record for the past 60 years. The European Union has been observing, and they are now moving to establish a legal basis from which to block infiltration from Beijing. A member of the European Parliament presented her draft report on foreign interference to an EU special committee on Tuesday. The report outlines loopholes that foreign powers could exploit. For critical infrastructure owned by foreign countries, the report highlights Greece's largest port, as well as undersea communication cables in parts of Europe both of which Chinese firms own. The reports also point out foreign powers are using local educational institutions and their elite to interfere in other countries' affairs. Universities' financial dependence on China is also on the list. The report calls for transparency of financing of European universities. And what is the scale of foreign interference? The report says authoritarian regimes have invested more than $300 million into 33 countries to interfere in democracies, and it's still increasing. The NBA asked Boston Celtics center N.S. Cantor to take off his free-to-bet shoes, and they got a solid no for an answer. Cantor ignited a firestorm by calling China's leader Xi Jinping a brutal dictator. 
The Boston Celtics player is using social media to get his messages to the masses. Beijing denies orchestrating any campaign against its Muslim minority, but the U.S. State Department estimates that up to two million Uyghurs have been held in detention camps. I actually, you know, learn it from the first hand. I, I sit down with so many, you know, concentration camp survivors, so, so many Hong Kongers and Tibetans. Uh, Tibetans and Taiwanese, and they were the one told me from first hand their story and w w what was uh, happening there. You know, I sit down with this concentration, you know, camp uh, survivor, and she was telling me about the the you know all the the, the horrible act that they were doing uh, in there. How much, how many times that she has raped and uh, tortured before, and she was telling me about the organ harvesting, and she was telling me about the surveillance uh, cameras. Cantor has also been wearing sneakers at games emblazoned with messages like freedom and no Beijing 2022 in opposition to the upcoming Olympics there. The backlash against his campaign was swift. China pulled Celtics games off its streaming service. The NBA says they've received many warnings and demands to ban Cantor. I don't care if I get fined, I'm not going to take my shoes off. And they told me, we are not talking about fine. We are talking about getting banned. I'm like, listen, I don't care if you, whoever is your boss is, go tell him I'm ready to get banned. Cantor insists that he didn't break any rules and that it's his responsibility to speak up for those suppressed in China. Human rights activists may be dismayed. The Olympic Committee has raised a pandemic warning for protest zones at the Beijing Olympics. According to its coordinator head on Tuesday, there may not be any official protest zones at the Games, depending on local public health measures. Human rights activists have voiced protests against the Beijing Winter Olympics over Beijing's treatment of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities. And Beijing rejects accusations of crimes against humanity and genocide. But the right to protest is enshrined in the host city contract. At the 2008 Beijing Olympics, three designated demonstration zones were set up in public parks, although none saw any protests. This time, international visitors are banned from attending the Games, but locals will be allowed in. A serious training accident on the Beijing Olympic Luge track is under investigation, the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, said on Tuesday. Earlier, a Polish slider hit a closed barrier that should have been open on the Beijing Olympic track. The track and the, the circumstances under which this accident happened are being investigated by both the Federation and the uh, uh, organizing committee very seriously. And if there are lessons to be learned, as probably there will, we will implement them and have plenty of time to implement. The Polish luger suffered serious leg injuries after he cracked his left kneecap and his right leg was cut to the bone. He had a successful surgery on Monday, but he recalled the track team was slow to react after the crash and says he spent half an hour on the ice before he was taken to the hospital. We need to wait now for uh, um, to see how the investigation goes ahead, but certainly we are close to the athlete as it could not be in any other way, and we will make sure that he's in the best conditions and recovers the sooner the possible. The Polish loser has not abandoned hopes of competing at the Games in February. He wrote on Facebook, overall it's okay, only the legs are scarred. A lot of unnecessary work before me, and we'll see how it goes. A record-breaking snowstorm and severe winds is wrecking havoc in northeastern China. It's snarling traffic, disrupting train and flight services, closing schools, and freezing millions of livestock. The Liaoning Provincial Rural Agriculture Department reported that 6.4 million livestock have frozen to death. Since the arrival of the cold wave on Sunday, temperatures in parts of northeastern China plunged by as much as 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius. In Inner Mongolia, houses are seen almost half buried by snow, and some cars were completely buried. The snow reached two feet deep over 46 hours. This is the longest recorded snowfall in 70 years. In Liaoning province, traffic has been severely affected. As of Tuesday, the majority of expressway toll stations were shut. Meteorological departments in Liaoning and Jiling province issued red alerts for snowstorms. That's the most severe in their four-tier weather warning system. Concerns are also rising about power supplies as temperatures fall. Locals in parts of northeastern China report experiencing outages of power, water and gas amid the snowstorm. 
In Heilongjiang province, the state grid Heilongjiang Electric Power Company suspended numerous power lines. Three quarters of a million people were affected. Many have taken the Chinese social media platform Weibo to complain. One said, electricity in my district has been out for a day and night. No electricity, no heating. When will it be restored? Another complained after the snow, it rained. I've been quarantined at home for a few days, and now the power and water suddenly went out. How am I supposed to live? Chinese state media reported that the authorities are working to increase coal imports and energy production. Authorities in Beijing continue to heighten virus prevention and control measures as new virus cases persist in the city. Health officials are now targeting in-person conferences and events. The vice director at the Beijing Center for Disease Prevention and Control said on Thursday that conferences and events should be held via video whenever possible. This as a district in Beijing found five new virus cases on Thursday. Within the district, a primary school and China's National Petroleum Corporation were temporarily closed. All people with a risk of contact have to undergo virus testing. Meanwhile, in Dalian, city authorities have ordered all businesses handling imported chilled and frozen foods to suspend operations after a virus outbreak. China says frozen foods pose a risk of spreading the virus if it is detected on packaging. This even though the World Health Organization says neither food nor packaging is a known transmission route. Dalian is a leading port for seafood shipments as well as fruit and some meats. The power crisis in China and the regime's clampdown on the cryptocurrency mining industry is creating opportunities in one of its neighboring countries, but it's also creating problems. Kazakhstan is struggling to meet the energy needs of its booming crypto mining industry. The Central Asian country is now the world's second biggest Bitcoin mining location after the United States, according to experts. Miners have moved en masse into the country due to its low energy prices and after China recently banned all crypto transactions and mining. That's presented a dilemma for local authorities. The government is trying to decide how to tax and regulate the largely underground and foreign-owned industry. The power used by miners has forced Kazakhstan to import energy and ration domestic supplies. Renat Malikov is a director of local mining company BTCKZ. Since the beginning of October, we have been facing restrictions. There are periods when the electricity is turned off. There are days when we are provided with only 20% of total capacity to meet our primary needs. Some see crypto as a way to make a quick fortune, but many governments are concerned privately run and highly volatile digital currencies could undermine their control of monetary systems. They believe it could also hurt investors and promote financial crime. With most Kazakh mining firms powered by aging coal plants, the business is also seen by many as contrary to global environmental goals. Unregistered operators are thought to consume even more electricity than recognized firms. Due to the emergence of many grey miners, companies which mine illegally, there is an electricity deficit in Kazakhstan. Because of the deficit, the government has to limit consumers, and mining companies that work legally, white miners, are the first to fall under the restrictions. Our company is on the list. Even so, as long as Kazakhstan's energy prices remain capped at artificially low levels, the miners probably aren't going anywhere. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, here's a short glimpse into this Friday's special report. The Chinese regime is hinting at war, from an amphibious landing exercise simulating an invasion across the Taiwan Strait, to increasing benefits for military members. To making changes to a law that gives Communist leader Xi Jinping more power to mobilize the country and wage a war. A series of military-related moves by China is raising concerns. Some worry the Communist regime is already on track toward preparing the country to invade Taiwan. And it may not stop at Taiwan either. A new Pentagon report underscoring the growing threat posed by Beijing saying China is accelerating its nuclear weapons program. Is the regime seriously trying to mobilize its 1.4 billion people for an invasion on Taiwan? If so, how soon? 
Or are the threats aimed at launching an information war across the street? And exactly where does the Taiwan issue come from? And why is it so critical? Taiwan is in microcosm uh, really the dispositive issue of the 21st century. We examine these questions and more in our next special report.